Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And for this episode we are going to take a look at a fairy tale, but not one of those nice, happy, fluffy fairy tales where it all ends happily ever after. In fact, this is quite a dark fairy tale, and while I don't want to spoil any of the surprises, there are accusations of murder, and there is... Well, actually, I can't say much more without spoiling it, so you'll just have to take my word for it. This is a good example of how a fairy tale can be nice and traditional on the one hand, but at the same time it has a darkness which can sucker punch you, and this is... It's not It's not a Disney fairy tale, let's put it that way. This is more original Brothers Grimm. All will be revealed very, very soon. Now, I've spoken quite a bit about the Welsh fairy folk on this podcast, who are most commonly known as Urtulloth Teg in Wales. Now, why are they called the Tulloth Teg? Well, it translates roughly as the fair folk or the fair family, but if you want the long answer... I've recorded an episode all about it. That was episode number 25, I believe. So if you do enjoy this and you'd like to know more about the Welsh fairy folk, about the Tullith Tig, then please go back and check out episode 25 afterwards. But for now, we are going to look at this dark fairy tale. And this concerns quite a popular motif in Welsh fairy tales, but not just Welsh fairy tales, in all fairy tales, most cultures have fairy tales which include magical fairy music. Yes, it's the music, it's the sound which is made from these fairy instruments, presumably, which usually means bad news for the people who hear it. When when they hear this music, it usually goes downhill quite quickly for them afterwards. As lovely as the sound is, it's a beautiful, beautiful melody, but you know, you know, no good can come of it. But again, maybe I am spoiling this story a little bit already again. So let's let's begin at the beginning. And this is a tale called Reese. And Llewellyn, Risa Llewellyn, two good, honest Welsh names there. And the version that I am referring to was recorded by pretty much the go to person when it comes to Welsh fairy tales who, who collected them in the, the early Edwardian times. And I, I believe I've referenced him before. If not, I will certainly reference him again in the future. And that was W. Jenkin Thomas. So this is. W. Jenkin Thomas's version that I'm referring to, and any quotes are coming from Mr. Thomas's accounts. And that's exactly what I'll do to set the scene, is to quote the first paragraph in this story of Rhys and Llewellyn, who are two farm servants, two friends, and it begins one fine evening when the pair of them at twilight, you can picture the scene, twilight in wild Wales amongst those, those rolling hills. And they are returning home to Llwyn a Fanon from the mountain where they had been cutting peat. So after a hard day's cutting peat, they were walking through a wood when Rhys suddenly said, Stop! Listen to that enchanting music. That's a tune I've danced to a hundred times and I can't resist it now. I must find the musicians and have my dance. If you don't want to stop, he said to Llewellyn, you can go and have your supper, and I'll be with you presently. Now, I did warn you that this was always a bad sign. As lovely as this music might be, if you follow this music, no good can come of it. And thankfully, Llewellyn had more sense than to do that. Rhys, however, was determined to go and have a little dance. To which Llewellyn said, Music and dancing, indeed. I hear no music, and how should you? Come, come, no nonsense, come home with me. And there's a lovely, lovely little description from Thomas in, in the book then which follows. And he says that Llewellyn might have spared his breath 
to cool the porridge which was awaiting him at Llyn a Fanon. And I love that. It's the kind of description which doesn't really work nowadays. But all good fairy tales need porridge in them. And, and it has to be hot porridge. Cold porridge doesn't work. And there, there is the hot porridge in this fairy tale. But anyway, with Llewellyn determined to go back and eat that porridge, Rhys plunged into the trees, leaving Llewellyn behind. Now, as mentioned, Llewellyn didn't actually hear the music. So it wasn't that he wasn't sort of tempted by it, but he, he just thought Reese was making something up. In fact, he suspected he was sneaking off to the pub or the alehouse, as it's described here, which was five miles away. So maybe at the time, five miles wasn't such a trek for, for a quick pint if you've spent all day walking up and down mountains. And he thought... Not much more of it. Reese has sneaked off for a pint five miles away. By the time he comes back again, you know, you're looking at a 10 mile, a 10 mile walk on top of all that drinking time. It would be quite a few hours before he saw Reese again. So off he went home. He ate his supper, tucked into that porridge and returned to rest in the stable loft without any anxiety about his companion. See, all these little omens are building up, aren't they? That music, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Reese, ah, no anxiety, I'm sure he's fine. Look, you might want to worry a little bit. But even so, Llewellyn woke up in the middle of the night, found himself alone, because Reese would usually be sleeping in that stable loft as well, and he was not there. Llewellyn simply assumed he was under the influence of the ale. And as mentioned, he had one heck of a walk to do. I mean, it was 10 miles plus without the drinking. And there's another lovely, lovely old expression used here. And <laughs> it is said that he could have been a wooing. A wooing. That's A W O O I N G. A wooing. And return before morning as he had often done before. Now, what exactly he gets up to when he goes a in after his drinking? That's, well, that's none of our business, is it? But the next morning, when the sun rose and the cock crowed, there was still no race. Llewellyn was questioned by his master. And he told the truth as far as, far as he was concerned. He said, look, he just ran off into the woods. I assumed he'd gone to the pub. But whatever Reese had been doing the night before, there was a heck of a lot of work, timely work, that had to be done. The pair of them had to get going. And so the boss man sent a messenger to the alehouse five miles or so away to find out what was going on. But when that messenger finally returned, they discovered that nobody had seen Reese at all that night. He had not been in the pub. He was not drinking. He was not a wooing. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky for Llewellyn, because he told the truth to an extent. He hadn't really talked about Reese here and music and stuff, because, you know, what, what was the point? He just sneaked off to the pub. However, as they now discovered, he had not gone to the pub, and the farmer wanted to know a little bit more about what was going on, and he pretty much gave Llewellyn an interrogation. And it was while being questioned again, Llewellyn did state that as they were walking through the wood, Reese had suddenly heard music and left him to join a dance. His master said, did you hear the music? And Llewellyn replied that he had not. And the whole thing is described as being unsatisfactory. How could one of them hear this music so loudly that they ran into the woods to dance to it and the other one heard absolutely nothing? Something did not quite add up in this story. Either way, telling the truth or not, there was a missing farm servant. Nobody knew where he was and they decided to go and search for him. And there was no trace of Reese to be found. They also inquired to find out where this dancing might have been, and they could discover no trace of any dance taking place that night either. They also inquired about music. Had any of the people living, walking around that area, heard th th this magical music that, that Llewellyn spoke of? Again, nobody heard a sound. And eventually, they seriously came to doubt 
Llewellyn's story. Yes, he'd certainly disappeared, but otherwise nothing added up. Therefore, they assumed a quarrel must have taken place. As they were walking home, Rhys and Llewellyn had fallen out for some reason, and I did mention this does get dark, they accused Llewellyn of murder. There was no sign of Rhys's body. He must have been killed. And the only person who saw him, who also made up this ridiculous story that nobody believed, was Llewellyn. He protested his innocence, but as he could give no account of his companion's disappearance, except that there was some kind of imaginary music and dancing going on, he was, we are told, generally thought to be guilty. And he was kept in prison until the dead body could be found and his guilt could be brought home to him. So very much a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I guess if you go off and follow it, then you never return. And if you don't go off and follow it, well, you end up in prison. So maybe running off with the Tullyth Tig isn't such a bad move after all. I don't know. That's uh, that's a deep philosophical question we can ponder at, at a later date. But back to the tale. And things remained thus, we are told, for nearly a year. So Llewellyn spent the best part of a year locked up in prison when a newcomer into the neighbourhood who had some experience of fairy ways and customs. See, now this is the first time that the fairy folk have actually been mentioned in this tale. But this newcomer who has some experience with their ways suggested that he and a company of neighbours should go with Llewellyn to the place where he parted from Rhys. So he wanted to get Llewellyn out of the prison and to retrace his steps and to show him exactly where he claimed Rhys had gone. And with his knowledge, he could presumably clear Llewellyn of any guilt or, or damn him even further, maybe, depending on, on how it went. But anyway, this was all agreed to and they came to what presumably the newcomer describes as the fairy ring. This was a fairy ring, the best indication yet that maybe Llewellyn wasn't a cold-blooded murderer after all. Now, Llewellyn says, put your foot on mine, David. I am assuming David is the fairy expert because there's no mention of a David in this story up to this point, but let's assume David is the fairy guy. And he says, put your foot on mine, David. And Llewellyn's foot was now upon the outward edge of the fairy circle to one of the company. David put his foot on Llewellyn's, and so did they all, one after another. So all of the neighbours had their foot upon each other's foot, and they were linking around this fairy ring when they heard the sound of many harps. Good old National Instrument of Wales there. The sound of many harps in full concert and saw within the circle a number of little figures enjoying themselves vastly. And I don't think I need to give a spoiler alert to say that those little folk were indeed the Tulloith Teg, the Welsh fairy folk. They were dancing round and round the ring with hands joined and among them was Rhys footing it with the best of them so this was not an unhappy Rhys who had been held against his will or murdered even as some had expected this is a Rhys who was still enjoying himself immensely dancing away just as he'd set out to do nearly a year ago now Llewellyn was naturally quite pleased to see him but also quite angry having spent all this time in prison as a result and as Reese went whirling by yes yes whirling by he was getting into the the swing of things Llewellyn reached out seized hold of his smock frock which if, if you don't know what that is it's the it's a rural kind of kind of clothing that the workers would have traditionally worn and it's <laughs> and I can't describe it, so you might have to do an internet search for smock frock if you really want to know what sm smock frock me. I can't even say it, never mind describe it. But anyway, Llewellyn reached out and grabbed Reese's smock frock and yanked him out of that circle, 
taken great care not to overstep the edge of the ring himself. Now, obviously, that means that if Llewellyn had overstepped, he would have been caught in this whatever magic was taking place inside the the, the fairy ring at the time. But he managed to get Reese out of there without falling in himself. And Reese wasn't too happy about being rescued. He said, or pleaded rather, he said, let me finish my dance. I never enjoyed a dance like this before, and I have not been above five minutes at it. Let me return to the dance. Now, as Reese has conveniently already let slip in that little little pleading, he believes he's been there for five minutes dancing with these fairies. As we know, he's been there the best part of 12 months. And as Llewellyn says, five minutes indeed. He's, he's now enraged, we are told. You've been there long enough to come near getting me hanged. And really, that is the key thing here, isn't it? The longer he stays in there dancing, the more chance Llewellyn has of losing his life. As he explains, I've been accused of murdering you, and you must clear my character. Come, answer for yourself, and account for your conduct. At which point, he restrains Reese by force. Even the fact that... Presumably, his best friend is about to be killed. As a result, does not stop him from wanting to return to that magical fairy ring. Llewellyn grips him, holds him by force. But when they return to face their questioners, Rhys has very little to say. All of the questions with which he was plied, he could only reply that he had been dancing for about five minutes. Now, let's assume, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume he does honestly believe that. It still doesn't really help his case. All he could say was they danced exquisitely, and that was it. Now, of course, as far as Llewellyn was concerned, he was instantly cleared of murder. I mean, Reese was standing there alive and well. And while the story still didn't quite add up and make sense to everyone, he was certainly no murderer. And when Reese was asked who the, these little people he was dancing with were, again, he said they were strangers to him. He had not eaten or drunk or slept, and he was in the same clothes as when he had disappeared. And having been freed, as it were, although in Reese's case against his will, so he thought, but either way, having been taken out of that ring, he was now forced to just simply return to his old way of life. And as a finale, we are told that Rhys became very sad as a result. He was sad, he was sullen, he was silent. He took to his bed, and before long, he died. Yes, he died, and I was not joking when I warned you that there is no happy ending to this fairy tale, I'm afraid. Race, having been taken away from that enchanted circle, returned to his old way of life and very soon after was no more. Seemingly overcome with a, a melancholy, a depression, wh whatever you want to describe it or however it would have been described at the time, the result was the same. And the moral of that story, if indeed there is a moral there, maybe there isn't. But if there is a moral, I guess we all need to be a little bit careful if we hear the sweet sound of the Welsh harp being played in the forest at night. And if one of our friends, if one of our companions claim to hear it and we can't, maybe we should take them a little bit more seriously than Llewellyn and not assume they're just trying to sneak off for a quick pint and a bit of a woo-in. Now, as mentioned at the start, I have recorded several episodes about the Welsh fairy folk now. And if you did enjoy this and you would like to go back and check out the earlier ones, the last one was episode 25, which looked at more of the sort of the overall history and origins of the fairy folks. And then before that, there's, to, to be honest, there's so many I've lost, I've lost count, but there's a full list of every episode on my website. Or when you listen to episode 25, I refer back to the ones before that. So you can listen to them in 
reverse chronological order, I guess. You can work backwards through the fairy stories. And, I mean, one of the great things with these kind of stories is you, you can't really spoil them. You can you can listen to these in any way, shape or form your, your heart desires. And, of course, there are a lot more on the way. There's a heck of a lot more. There's enough Welsh fairy tales and folklore about the Tullyth Tig to keep me going for, well, I, I could waffle on for years and years about them. So, as always, if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of the future episodes about the Welsh fairy folk and all the other ghosts and goblins and weird stuff I, I go on about, please consider hitting the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. Now, as to this one, I would love to know your thoughts on this. Maybe you've heard the sweet sound of fairy music being played in a forest late at night or early in the morning, wherever it might be. But if you had any similar experiences or if you know of other similar tales, maybe they've taken place elsewhere in the world. I mean, this to me sounds very, very sort of grim fairy tales in a way to it. It has that more european feel to it and if you have any thoughts any ideas any comments you'd like to make as always i'm quite easy to find online just do a search for mark race on a search engine or on social media and if you put the word ghosts in or folklore or whales you will find me i'll pop up on top and we can have a chat online all about it and it just leaves me to say that, as usual, I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best, it's the beautiful, it's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Thank you very much for listening. Diolch and Varian am grando. And remember, heed my warning, beware that music. And if you won't listen to me... Maybe you'll remember what happened in William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream when Titania said to Bottom, What? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? To which Bottom replied, I have a reasonable good year in music. Let's have the tongs and bones. Now, what Bottom is saying there is, Yes, please. I have a pretty good year for music. I'd like to hear it. What he doesn't say is they are also pretty long and pretty big years because the fairies have already turned him into an ass or a donkey as we say in polite company nowadays and bear that in mind yes that fairy music might sound nice but do you really want the head of a donkey as a result until next time no star <laughs>